The Taliban have regained control in Afghanistan amid a chaotic U.S. evacuation, bringing a tragic end to a 20-year bipartisan foreign policy disaster that American officials of both parties bear responsibility for and which they have repeatedly lied about. For more on this, it's time for a closer look. The crushing reality of the so-called global war on terror is that some of the highest ranking officials involved in it now admit that it was a colossal failure, and that's a reality we should all grapple with. Presidents, politicians, and foreign policy elites of both parties deserve blame for this calamity. In his new book, Reign of Terror, author Spencer Ackerman writes, in 2020, I asked Stanley McChrystal, the former Joint Special Operations Command and Afghanistan War Commander, if the war on terror had been worth it. It would be impossible to argue that it was, he answered. The outcome just hasn't been positive enough to argue that. That's not an anti-war activist saying that. That's the former commander of the war in Afghanistan saying the 20-year war on terror was a failure. It's like if Kevin Feige said, honestly, I have no idea what's going on in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. None of it makes sense to me. I mean, they all have superpowers, but every fight comes down to karate. What the hell, right? Of course, in reality, the only thing Feige has to apologize for is not putting Vince Vaughn in Loki. You missed a huge opportunity to create some buzz and reunite the greatest comic duo since Laurel and Hardy. Buddy, buddy, buddy. And I say that because there are three of you. I'm sorry to reference 2005's Wedding Crashers. That movie's so old, it came out four years after the start of the war in Afghanistan. A comment like that from McChrystal, the idea that the so-called war on terror has been a 20-year failure, should provoke some serious introspection and soul-searching on the part of Washington elites. And yet somehow, I can't exactly imagine the people responsible for this calamity looking inward and holding themselves accountable for it. George W. Bush is too busy in his art studio trying to, I don't know, get a dog's eyebrow right. So strange that sandwiched between James Patterson's co-author and New England's newest party promoter, we have a former president who's just okay at painting. Also, are the dogs supposed to look like him? I'm not crazy, right? Doesn't it kind of look like the dogs have Bush's face? And that expression of his that says, I don't know the answer to your question. And yet, as tragedy unfolds in Afghanistan, the political world is, of course, engaged in finger-pointing for what has been a generational, bipartisan failure that presidents and politicians of both parties bear responsibility for. For example, over the weekend, former Trump Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tried to claim this would not have happened under the previous administration, but got called out by Fox host Chris Wallace. It looks like the Biden administration has just failed in its execution of its own plan. The plan should have been, much like we had, was that we would have an orderly, conditions-based way to think about how to draw down our forces there. I can assure you, uh, were I still the Secretary of State with a Commander-in-Chief like President Trump, the Taliban would have understood that there were real costs to pay. You were the first American Secretary of State to ever meet with the Taliban, and you talked about how they had agreed to join us in the fight against terrorism. Do you regret giving the Taliban that legitimacy? Do you regret pressing the Afghan government to release 5,000 prisoners, which they did, some of whom are now back on the battlefield fighting with the Taliban? Chris, you make peace with your enemies. Chris, we never trusted the Taliban. You can, you can ask them yourselves. We didn't take the word of the Taliban. We watched their actions on the ground when they did the right thing and they helped us against terror. That was all good. And when they didn't, we crushed them. All right, first of all, there's literally a picture of you meeting with a Taliban leader the Trump administration had released from prison. That's from November, nine months ago. It's not some ancient photograph from 30 years ago that we had to unearth by digging through microfiche at the National Archives and then smuggling it out in a rolled up copy of the Constitution like Nick Cage and National Treasure. Although I would give anything to hear Nick Cage say the word microfiche. There's a secret message written by Benjamin Franklin's ghost and it exists only on microfiche. <laughs> National Treasure, three years after the beginning of the war in Afghanistan. <laughs> Second, you think the Trump plan would have been more orderly than what's happening now? You guys are the ones who wanted to withdraw by May. I have a hard time believing Trump would have done it in a more orderly way since nothing he ever did was orderly. He couldn't even withdraw from an umbrella in orderly fashion. Instead of armchair generals engaging in craven political point scoring, what we need right now is everyone calling for the U.S. to accept as many Afghan refugees as possible. That includes Afghans who worked with the U.S. Army, but it shouldn't be limited to them. We should welcome anyone who wants to come. What should the Biden administration be doing for the people of Afghanistan right now? Every Afghan 
who is interested in doing so should be given asylum inside the United States. This should be an urgent process. This should be fast-tracked, and the logistics of it uh, can be uh, in part the responsibility of one of the greatest logistical organizations on the planet, which is the United States military and in particular, the United States Air Force. The idea that uh, what the Biden administration is doing is helping get out Afghans who worked for the United States military or served the United States occupation, that is a moral floor that is functioning as a moral ceiling. Working with the United States should not be a condition of acceptance by American refugee admissions people. That's exactly right. Taking in as many Afghan refugees as want to come here and granting them asylum is the bare minimum we can do, and we should be doing it as fast as possible. And we have the logistical capability to do it. I know it's not the same, but when I got my vaccine at a FEMA site, I was in and out in 20 minutes with a shot in my arm and a CDC card that for some reason doesn't fit in my wallet. And I know today probably isn't the right time to plug a product, but I'm excited to announce my wallet, the new awkwardly sized wallet built specifically to hold your vaccine card. My wallet, order now to receive a free pair of my weird pants. The only pants with pockets big enough to hold my wallet. Anyway, the point is we should be marshalling the same logistical prowess to take in as many Afghan refugees as possible as quickly as possible. The priority should be getting them out now and worrying about the paperwork later. And yet for some reason, the process for many Afghans, including those who worked with the US has been a nightmare. For example, the Atlantic detailed the plight of one interpreter who worked alongside NATO combat units. His first visa application, like those of so many others, was denied on spurious bureaucratic grounds. His second attempt hung in limbo for years as he tried to track down the human resources department of the military contractor that had employed him and that subsequently went through several changes of ownership and name. Holy shit, just let him come here. Screw the paperwork and the red tape. Why are we putting them through a process that's more complicated than trying to switch your Verizon bill to a new address? No, I don't want to upgrade to the triple play package. I just want to move my service. I know I do not want to add a phone line. I'm just moving. I do not know my account PIN number. No, I do not know my 11-digit billing code. What's my dog's middle name? Hey, what's your middle name? He doesn't know. And those attempting to flee now in the face of the Taliban onslaught are dealing with the same chaos and confusion as NBC reported over the weekend. We went to a processing center today, a private kind of pop-up office where there was a two two people with a computer in front of them and the office was packed with afghans coming in who were trying to navigate their way through this u.s state department's website all the documentation that they need to provide is in english they need to be in multiple copies hmm. and a lot of the people who were coming in certainly didn't speak English, and because it's not just translators. You have security guards, and you have contractors, and cleaners. Not all of them uh, speak English and can navigate their way through a, a website. Why are we making this so complicated? You need to navigate a government website with multiple copies of your personal records in a packed office with just two people at a computer? So basically, it's the DMV. We just recreated the DMV, and no one should ever have to go through that. Last time I was at the DMV, I waited in line so long, I grew a mustache, and they ended up putting the wrong name on my license. <laughs> and then my license was too small to fit in my new My Wallet. <laughs> the tragedy that is unfolding now is the culmination of a two decade long legacy of failure left behind by politicians of both parties who repeatedly withheld the truth from the American people. When Bush first announced the invasion of Afghanistan 20 years ago, the goal at the time, according to Bush and the politicians that supported the war, was to retaliate against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime that was shielding it and to prevent future attacks. And as the war dragged on, Bush continued to insist the U.S. was succeeding in its mission. I said a long time ago, one of our objectives is to smoke them out and get them running and bring them to justice. We're smoking them out, they're running, and now we're gonna bring them to justice. Remember when the president routinely used the phrase smoke them out like he was in an episode of Branded? And I'm sorry, to drop a branded reference, but sometimes you gotta pander to the people who are too old for the mass jokes. <laughs> Hope you guys liked it! <laughs> Throughout the war, Bush promised that the U.S. would not repeat the history of failure that had beset past empires in Afghanistan. The history of military conflict in Afghanistan. It's been one of initial success, followed by long years of floundering and ultimate failure. We're not going to repeat that mistake. 
The very thing they told us wouldn't happen is exactly what happened. He sounds like he's describing his own battle with a poncho. We had some initial success followed by floundering and ultimate failure, but we won't be deterred. Next, we're gonna try an umbrella hat. Umbrellas aren't easy either. Just FYI. They knew early in the war that the danger of failure and instability was very real, and behind the scenes, they even admitted they had no idea what to do about it. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld wrote in an internal memo only six months after the war started, we are never going to get the U.S. military out of Afghanistan unless we take care to see that there's something going on that will provide the stability that will be necessary for us to leave. Help, he wrote. He literally wrote the word help with an exclamation point. You know, the same way you text your spouse when you're trapped in a conversation at a dinner party that you desperately want to get out of. Rick has been talking about his metal cover band for 20 minutes. They're called Age Against the Machine, help. The Bush administration kicked off a 20-year bipartisan tradition of lying about the war in Afghanistan and shielding the American people from the truth of what was really happening. We know that from blockbuster reporting in 2019 from the Washington Post, which got its hand on a confidential trove of documents called the Afghanistan Papers, in which senior U.S. officials from both parties admitted they'd been lying about the reality about how the war was really going. For example, a three-star Army general who served as the White House's Afghan war czar during the Bush and Obama administration said in 2015, we were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. We didn't know what we were doing. What are we trying to do here? We didn't have the foggiest notion of what we were undertaking. The US foreign policy apparatus should not approach Afghanistan the same way I approach trying to install a wireless router. Connect the router to a broadband gateway from your ISP by inserting the ethernet cable to the port located on the back of the TP link. I don't have the foggiest notion of what I'm undertaking. Do you know how this works? Why am I asking you? And instead of being honest and telling that to the American people, officials cherry picked and misrepresented the data to make the war look like it was going much better than it actually was. For example, an army colonel who served as a senior counterinsurgency advisor to US military commanders in 2013 and 14 told government interviewers every data point was altered to present the best picture possible. Surveys, for instance, were totally unreliable, but reinforced that everything we were doing was right, and we became a self-licking ice cream cone. What? Is that a thing? A self-licking ice cream cone? That sounds like something that would get pitched on an episode of Shark Tank where everyone laughs, but then Mark Cuban invests, and then three years later, you hear that it somehow sold for one billion to Apple, and you go to a party, and all your friends have self-licking ice cream cones, try it. It's called the iCone, it's Siri enabled. It tracks your steps. The majority of Americans want the forever war in Afghanistan to end. Should have ended a long time ago. Ending it now is the only option. But one thing we can and must do right now is accept as many refugees and grant as many Afghans asylum as we possibly can as quickly as we can. And if there's anyone left in politics or the media who disagrees, who fear mongers about taking in as many refugees as we can, then when election time comes, I hope voters will. Smoke them out. This has been Closer Look. God's Love We Deliver cooks and brings over two million meals a year to men, women, and children living with HIV, AIDS, cancer, and other serious illnesses, and they need your help now more than ever. If you're watching this online, you can hit the donate button. Stay safe, get vaccinated. We love you.